I want to take you to the account in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. It's a phenomenal, um, phenomenal chapter in the Bible because it accounts for three parables that Jesus is speaking. Jesus is telling these three parables. And if you don't know what a parable is, a parable is a story that effectively conveys a profound truth in a relatable and accessible way. And the Gospels were written at a time where not many people were literate. So the oral tradition was the primary way of conveying truth or conveying uh, um, an understanding and uh, parables were a, a really important or a key way for Jesus to convey a profound spiritual truth. Luke chapter 15, uh, also interesting to note is that Luke 15 was not intended for um, uh, an unbelieving audience. Luke chapter 15 was actually, all three parables were actually a response to the grumblings of the Pharisees. Pharisees were these religious leaders that were highly studied, highly educated, uh, but highly religious in their mindset. And so Luke chapter 15 was a direct response to the grumbling of the Pharisees when they observed that Jesus was actually shock horror, having lunch with uh, tax collectors and prostitutes and people that they deemed were uh, unrighteous or unholy. And the first of the parable was the parable of the lost sheep. The second parable in Luke 15 was the parable of the lost coin. And the third parable was the parable of the lost son. We haven't got time to read the whole thing, but I do recommend that in your own time, you do read Luke chapter 15. But today, I have preached from Luke 15 a lot uh, through the years, and if you've been at Nations Church, you probably recognize the text. But today I want to go down a familiar path to look at new things. Is that okay? We're going to go down a familiar path, we're going to look at new things. And Jesus begins to tell this parable by telling the religious leaders that there was this father. He, he, he was using this parable saying this, this father had two sons, and the youngest son comes up to the dad one day and says, Dad, I want an early inheritance. I want you to give me my half of the money. Now, the shocking thing about this, it would have been shocking in now in our day and age, but the shocking thing in the first century was that this was incredibly dishonoring that a son would say in Jewish culture to a father, I wish you were dead and I want my money now. That's essentially what he's saying. Now, it was incredibly shocking at the time, so the, the early hearer would have, uh, would have gotten that shock factor from Jesus. But what was even more shocking was the way that Jesus unfolded the rest of the parable. Jesus goes on to say that the father actually gave the son everything that he asked for, did not withhold, and so kindly and graciously allowed him to take his half of the inheritance. He now goes and blows his half of the inheritance on wild, prodigal living, on prostitutes and all the different vices. And the day comes when he's completely out of money that he finds himself eating with the pigs. The Bible then, Jesus then goes on to say that he comes to his senses and begins to get up from where he was when he realizes that life outside of the father's house, outside of the father's covering was nothing like he thought it was going to be. And he now turns and goes back and returns to the father. In his own mind, he thought to himself, well, the only way that I can go back and be accepted by the father is if I ask dad to take me back in as a servant, then maybe, just maybe, I would earn my place back to be able to live in the father's house. Jesus goes and corrects all of these wrongful paradigms. We're going to pick up this account here in Luke chapter 15, verse 20. You ready for this? Who's ready to read Bible? All right, let's go. Verse 20. So he got up and went to the father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Luke 15 verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son who was in the field, when he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So we called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. This is the reaction I want you to note. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. His father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, 
You are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise for that incredible text? So good. Right now, we want to welcome our Cork Campus 2 to the stream. Give them a big hand. Hello, Roland, Leanne, and all the family there. Hope you got something out of that text. Today, I want to speak to you on the thought, by the Father's side. By the Father's side. That title will make complete sense to you as we begin to, to just talk a little bit around Luke chapter 15. But it's obvious that the central character in this text today is the son who has disobeyed the father. He's taken his inheritance and he's gone and squandered it. And we call him the prodigal son or the lost son and him returning to his father's house. That is a vital learning. That is, it's really important for our theology for you to understand that there is absolutely nothing that you can do by way of your work or your self-effort that could earn you the Father's love or approval. He already loves you, not because of you, but because of his, the goodness of His heart. Come on, somebody. The great lie of the enemy is, is to tell people that you are too far gone, that maybe you have too much ground to catch up on because of all the bad things you've done. So it's really not worth it. Stay lost. Stay confused. Don't go to God because He will condemn you and He will make you try and earn acceptance and approval. And the more bad you've lived your life, the more you've got to make up for it by works and by effort. And I think that's often become the stumbling block for people to truly encounter the love of God. The great lie of the devil is to put religious work in front of people as a barrier to stop them from receiving this beautiful grace that is found in Jesus Christ. Now, the early hearers understood all that was going on here. The religious leaders of the day, remember this account was targeted at them. And so this is the whole account. And Jesus begins to say that while the young son, the younger son was still a long way off. In other words, he turns, gets up and walks towards home. In our modern vernacular, he would have been at the top of the driveway. You know what I'm talking about? He's at the top of the driveway. The father sees him and the reaction and the response of the father was nothing like what the religious leaders of the day expected. They expected Jesus to tell the parable in such a way as the son was coming from a long way off and the father stood at the door waiting for him to arrive and then chastised him and made him into a servant to make him earn back because that was exactly the Jewish mindset of the day. Even today, it would make sense to us that if you do bad, you're going to get bad. You get what you deserve. It's what society has taught us. But this is not the parable that Jesus was telling. Jesus says this, that the father waits at the front door every day until this final day when the son appears a long way off. The father, so filled with compassion, runs towards the son. And look at the three actions that the father does that was particularly jarring to the religious mindset. Jesus says the father puts a robe on the son, signifying that, son, you don't need to do anything or work your way back under my covering. You already have it because of who you are. Come on, somebody. And then the father puts a ring on his finger to symbolize a commitment that the covenant is completely restored again. And then the father puts sandals on his son's feet to symbolize dignity that is now returning. Not because the son did anything by way of having to earn his way back in the father's house as a servant, but he was a son because he had a father who loved him. Come on, somebody say amen. But you've got to remember as beautiful and meaningful as this account of Luke 15 was for anyone who has never received the love of Jesus, and that's the genius of the way Jesus tells this parable, is that if you've never received the, the beautiful, wonderful, saving grace of Jesus, if you read Luke 15, your heart is going to be moved towards the heart of the Father because it reveals the heart of the Father. But I would suggest to you today that the account in Luke 15, knowing the context that it wasn't aimed at, people that were far from God, but it was actually aimed at religious leaders, we begin to see that the most central character of the account of the prodigal son was perhaps not the prodigal son or the father, but it was actually the older brother. Perhaps what Jesus wanted to convey the most by telling it the way that he did was to aim the story at the very religious people that complained and grumbled to the public square that this 
carpenter from Galilee was having lunch with prostitutes, tax collectors, and publicans. These people that were religious had spent years studying hours debating theology in the hallowed sanctuaries of the synagogue. This father in the parable, in our English translation, tells us that it's the parable of the lost son, that he had one lost son. If you were actually to read your English, English translation, the English translations would have put up on your third part of Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost or the prodigal son. Can I suggest to you that that did not appear in the original manuscript? It was the English translator's best way of trying to convey to you what that parable was about. But if you were actually to see the context of Luke chapter 15 and the audience with which the parables were intended for, can I suggest to you today that the father of the house did not have one lost son, but he had two lost sons. Because it is quite possible for us to be lost not just outside of the house, but also inside of the house. It is quite possible for us to be in the Father's house, but not have the Father's heart. Could it be that this account in Luke chapter 15, as beautiful and central as the beautiful account of the Father coming back to restore relationship with the Son who squandered the inheritance, could it be that this passage in Luke chapter 15 was actually a powerful cautionary note for each and every person that is possible for us here in the house of God, to be so enamored by the house of God, but be nowhere near the heart of the Father. To be so busy doing Father's house things, come on somebody, that we forget what it's like to actually carry the Father's heart. The question to you today is, are you in the Father's house, but not standing by the Father's side? Come on. Or are you in the Father's house and right by, see the, the account of Luke chapter 15, here's the tragedy. The tragedy was not that the younger son took the inheritance and squandered it on prodigal wild living and return to the father. That was, it had a beautiful ending. The tragedy was that there was an older son who was not standing by the father's side at the door. And should the community, the lost, the unloved, the hurting and the broken want to experience the bride of Christ, will she find her standing next to the father or will she find her judging? Come on. Turning her nose up. Hello? Hello? Come on, whispering behind the back. Oh, that unclean person. Oh, come on. I want to be part of a church that begins to awaken, not just the fact that we're in the Father's house, but we have the Father's heart. Let it be known about our church that we're the kind of church that regardless of the darkness of your past, the color of your skin, your ability or lack thereof, no matter who you are, you are welcomed by the grace of God, but not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Oh, come on. I'm preaching good this morning. And there have been seasons in my life where I have been the older brother. I have sat in judgment of people that, ah, oh, you should get your act together. I have sat turning my nose up at people that weren't at the same place that I've been at, struggling in their own issues. And I've been the older brother. And you know what's been frustrating uh, for me at different times? Seeing the fact that God blesses people that were struggling more than me. Here's the thing about the grace of God. From the vilest of sinners to the most practiced of saints, we are all equal at the foot of the cross. Thank God for that. This brother was outraged, the older brother. He was outraged that the father would dare to kill the fattened calf, throw a party, put a robe on his brother, ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. How did, if he only knew what if he only knew what my younger brother was up to, this was completely unacceptable. And to the religious mindset, to the Pharisees of the day, this was particularly shocking because they knew where Jesus was, where Jesus was going with this. They could see themselves being played out through the voice of the older brother. And there have been seasons in my own life where I have found myself not standing by the Father's side. And so today I want to go through some signs of when we're not standing by the Father's side. Is that okay? Here's when, I, here's when I've noticed that I haven't been standing by the Father's side. Is when I'm more concerned about how the Father's house, sorry, when I'm more concerned about getting from the Father's house than I am about sharing the Father's love. When I'm far more concerned about getting from the Father's house than I am about sharing the Father's love. I don't know what you think about what church should be, but if you come to church thinking, what am I going to get out of it? We need to transition. We need to move from that wrong thinking of church is about what I can get out of it 
versus I'm part of a church that shares or reflects the Father's love. Come on, somebody. If your Christian faith is about getting more out of church, I promise you that is both insatiable as well as unsustainable. It is in, insatiable because you'll never be satisfied. If you come with a mindset to church today, I'm going to see what I can get out of church. I promise you the time is going to come where you will be dissatisfied with that and you'll just take yourself off to another church, see what you can get out of that church. And after a while, you go to another church, see what you can get out of it. It is insatiable. And that insatiability will always lead to an unsustainable way of doing your Christianity because you'll inevitably be disappointed. No church will ever be good enough for you. No father's house will ever be good enough for you. Come on, somebody. And it's in, in, in that unsustainability that you will feel disillusioned with church. You know that you can only be disillusioned if you're first under an illusion. And the illusion is that your Christianity is about getting out of the Father's house. Can I share with you today that the truth of every believer is that you're not called to get stuff out of the Father's house. You're called to share the Father's heart. Come on. To share the Father's love. And if you judge the basis of the Father's house, based on what you can get out of it, it is both insatiable and unsustainable. Jesus, in all four of the Gospels, there's an account of him going to the temple in Jerusalem and he's flipping the tables. He notices that something had come in into, into the temple that, that was not his original intended design for it. He sees that there's tables for currency exchange. He sees there's tables for selling doves and pigeons and goats and lamb. See, people in those days would have to travel far and wide to come to the temple in Jerusalem. And when they did, they had to do it with some intentionality. It cost them to worship God. They had to come already pre-prepared. A mom and dad would have to discuss about the kind of exact money they had to change to give their tithe. They then had to prepare the unblemished uh, um, dove or pigeon or lamb, whatever they could afford. And they had to think of ways where they could transport that animal all the way from wherever they are, two, three days journey, and to make sure that it was dust-free. It was encapsulated beautifully in some case or some cage somewhere that would have to keep it fed and keep it healthy and keep it plump and all of those things. And when they got to Jerusalem, they would hand that to the priest who would then take that with great gratitude and sacrifice it on their behalf for the propitiation of sins. Make sense to you guys? But when Jesus got to the temple that day, he discovered that some people had some bright ideas as to how to make church convenient. So they put out these currency exchange tables where people would just come throw a few coins, get the right drachmas or shekels and put in their tithes. And then they would kind of pick a couple of doves and a couple of pigeons from the table and pay their money and take that, hand it to the priest and then get the blessing and go off. They began to go from a worship that cost them something, sacrificial worship, to now what, can, what blessing can I get out of the house of God real quick? Jesus began to flip those tables. Can I say to you today that I think Jesus is still flipping tables? He's still flipping tables today to say, hey, the house of God is not somewhere you come to to take from. And then Jesus says this phrase that was very, very odd. He says, do not turn my father's house into a den of thieves. There was nothing illegal happening in the account of the, the table flipping in the temple. Under Roman rule, it was completely legal for them to provide currency exchange, completely legal for them to sell merchandise in the temple. There was nothing illegal. There's nothing thieving happening about that. But it was the phrase, do not turn my father's house into a den of thieves, that was probably best translated, do not turn my father's house into a den of takers. Because that's not what the father's house is all about. You guys are getting real quiet. Come on. Then the disciples remembered zeal for your house has consumed me. They were corrected, recalibrated again. Come on, are you out there? I want to be found not just in the Father's house trying to take more from it, I want to be found in the Father's house standing by my Father's side so that those that are far from God can be given all that I've been given. Come on, somebody give Jesus a big shout of praise. The second sign that I'm not standing by the Father's side is that I'm more concerned about how the Father's house affects me than I am concerned about how the Father's house affects the lost. Come on. Hello. This older brother was concerned. If you kill the fatted calf, um... Uh, there's not going to be any fat cows left for me. If you throw a party for my younger brother, there's not going to be enough money to throw a party for me. Come on, this is for mature ears only. I want to suggest to you today, you have everything you need. If you're in the Father's house, you already have everything you need. It's time for people that don't have what you have to experience what you've got. 
Hear my heart. It's, it's, it's important to me that the church comforts Christians. Absolutely. And it's important to me that your experience of God is cultivated, that, that, that your discipleship, that you're growing God. Absolutely. Do we do you provide pastoral care? 100%. I want you to hear my heart. However, you need to understand that comforting Christians, even though that's part of what we do, that's not our mandate. Do you understand? It's the great commission, not the great acquiescence. Sometimes we come thinking, oh, you need to acquiesce me. I need church to be like this. I need to be like that. And can you fix that for me? And can you do that to suit me? And we make it the great acquiescence, but it's never that. It's always been the great commission. And when you think about the Father's heart, there is a burning desire for the Father to say, this, this is not for us Christians. This is for people that are far from God that don't have what we've got. Come on, somebody. And when we think about the Father. His heart would have broken, not just for the son who was lost, but every day that he stood at the front door of his house, his other son was not there with him, waiting for a brother to come home. We need to be found by the Father's side. Come on, somebody. The third, the third sign that I'm not standing by the Father's side is that I'm more concerned about how I'm treated in the Father's house than how those that aren't in the Father's house are treated. Some of you might be thinking, you know when they have water baptisms and those water baptism visitors come and like, you know when they have, when they have you know, baby dedication and those baby dedication visitors come, they have like catered food and stuff. We just have Anna's biscuits <laughs> and instant coffee. <sighs> visitors get all the real, the, all the good car parks, they, the new people get them. The new people get the free barista coffee. We have to pay for it. Queue up. What are you, what are you guys doing spending so much money on like love community Christmas parties? Why are you spending so much money on Heroes Academy? Why are you putting so much effort and time and talent? See, you know that you're no longer standing next to the Father when you are far more concerned about how you're treated in the Father's house than you are about how the Father's house is treating people that are far from God. You can see how this is this was being so pointed towards the Pharisees of the day. They were complaining that Jesus had all the time in the world for the tax collector and the publican and the prostitute and the drunkards. And Jesus sat with them and shared the love of God with them, called down a short tax collector from a tree and has dinner at his house. And Jesus had hardly any time for the Pharisees. If you're ever wondering why some of our leaders will ignore you in the foyer and go straight to someone with a black welcome bag, now you know why. Don't get angry. Just stand with us by the Father's side. Come on, somebody. And be someone that welcomes people that are far from God into the house of God. I've had people, you might not believe me, but I've had people leave our church because they've said this, oh, the church, it's just, it's just too many new people. No one knows me anymore. <laughs> you, you, so you, you left because more prodigals came home? Can you see how it's so easy for us to be in the Father's house? but not by the Father's side. It's so easy for us to be in the house of God and still lost on the inside. Come on, is this making sense to you guys? The older son yelled at the father, enraged, outraged. How dare you? Kill the fatted calf for him. How dare you? How dare you? To which the father said, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. This is the father to the older son. But we had to, we were compelled to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Do you know that there are no sweeter words in heaven than for angels to say, so-and-so was lost, but now he is found. Every day there is a celebration. There is a party going on. They celebrate each name that is in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Sebastian is lost, but now is found. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lynn is lost, but now she's found. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Joseph is lost, but now is found. Hallelujah. Thank Thank you, Jesus. John was lost, but now is found. We got to celebrate the same thing that heaven celebrates. What must matter to us must be the same things that matter to God. 
Luke chapter 14 accounts for another parable. Jesus, again, tells a parable to convey a profound truth as to the heart of the Father toward a lost humanity. And he accounts for a master who puts on a banquet. Now, in the first century in Israel at the time, whenever, in, particularly in Jewish culture, whenever the word banquet is, is spoken of, you, can, you gotta think about an, an event where the master of the house spares no expense. The whole idea was that he would empty his bank account, spare no expense to put on a feast and everyone was invited and it was often only done once or twice in a lifetime. It was usually around weddings or something very, very special. And Luke chapter 14 accounts for, for uh, Jesus saying that there was a master who puts on a banqueting table and he invites everyone to come to this banqueting table. And the whole thing about the banqueting table is that no one is excluded. Everyone can come. And the the obligation of the master of the house was to provide as much food and as much drink as they possibly can out of all of the richness of what they've got. Spare no expense. Making sense to you guys. Now it makes sense why in the wedding of the Cana of Galilee, the master of the house freaked out because they ran out of wine because his heart was to provide food and drink for as many people as possible. So here is the master and he, and he provides his massive banqueting table and the banqueting table signifies the banqueting table of salvation. How many of you know that Jesus was the greatest price that heaven could pay for our salvation? Come on, somebody. And the master signifies the father and he's prepared this banqueting table and everyone's invited to participate. Every tribe, every tongue, Jew and Gentile is invited to participate in this banqueting table of salvation. He sends the servants out to go and invite everyone. And when they invite everyone, they brought a report back. Um, a few people gave some, some excuses. Um, one person said that they just got married and so they can't come. Another person said they bought some cows so they can't come. Another person said they bought a block in Baldivis so they can't come. Because everyone's just busy, can't come. To which the master said, oh, I want you to go out and invite more people to come. We're actually going to pick up this account of Luke 14, verse 21. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered the servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. See, that is an important theological understanding. When it comes to the beautiful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is room for everyone. We must never have the mindset that we are full. Come on, somebody. We must never have the mindset that this is us four and no more. You must never have, don't ever be in a, if you're in a connect group that says, oh, no, we're full, we can't have any more, go to a different connect. That's not the kingdom. That's a book club. The master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. And then when it's full, we're going to make more room. And on and on it goes. There's this beautiful account of the desire of the Father that always there's more, always there's more. You know, Nations Church first started, Joseph and Lynn were there, Clara were there, in a civic center community hall that was far too big for us at the time. But it was in the early days that the few of us that planted the church even though we were in the Father's house, we made a decision. We were always going to stand by the Father's side. And we welcomed people in the house of God. And that service became full, so we made more room. We went to two services. And after those two services, we decided, well, we need to get out of here and go to somewhere bigger. So we turned a basketball court into some, and we began to fill that too. And we flipped the orientation around. We made more room. We made more room again and went to two services. We went to three services, bought a building. We had more locations. Why? Today, we've got six locations in Western Australia. I can tell you now, that's not the end of it. There's more room. We're going to make more room. We'll never stop making more room. We've got a service today running in Cork, and we've got a service, two services today running in Phnom Penh. We're going to make more room. This is not the end of it for us. The Father's banqueting table has room for more. There's more people that you've never met. You were the person that someone had never met before, but now you've found family. Come on, somebody. Let's never say, let's never say, oh, they got treated better than, oh, why do they always get the special treatment? You were treated specially once. You got given the bag once. You got ushered in the welcome lounge once. You got your name taken out on a card once. You got a call once. You got free coffee once. It's time for us to flip the script and be by the Father's side. Come on, somebody give Jesus a big shout of praise. You know why I think sometimes we have the mindset of the older brother? And it was implied here in the text in Luke 15. We actually forget that we already have access to everything. 
we just forget that you've got access to the grace of God. You've got access to community. You've got access to people that would love you and support you. You've got access to the preaching of the word. You've got access to encounters with God. You have access. Everything that you need and want is already here. You have access to it. And I think sometimes we can take for granted what we've got access to, that we actually forget that what we have is available for everybody else that doesn't have it. Do you understand that? And you know, you never quite know. You never quite know the full impact of what the actions of your life will be should you choose to not just be in the Father's house, but to stand by the Father's side. You, ne- you, you never know. You, you just never know, not maybe on this side of eternity, what kind of impact you'll make by deciding today, I'm not just going to be in the Father's house, I'm going to also have the Father's heart. I remember many years ago, I was uh, a young accountant. I worked in the city, in Adelaide Terrace, uh, for about five years for an engineering firm. I was in the commercial division. And um, I was only young then and, and uh, you know, young to the firm, but also young professionally as well. And I remember in the last couple of years when I was working for that firm, um, there was a, a new manager that was employed. He, he was a very capable man, and he, he uh, was in charge of one of the big divisions within the firm. And uh, when he first came, you know, he, he, he made quite an impression. He, he, everybody has somewhere in their, in, their, in their workplace somebody that no one really likes. <laughs> we'll delete that off the uh, podcast. Um, no one really liked him. Uh, he, he had a very strong personality. He was very bullish, very opinionated. And, you know, he, he would railroad people. He was very, very smart cat, really competent. But he wasn't really winning friends and influencing people, okay? Uh, put it that way. And, and so he was, he was like fairly high up manager, and um, I was a fairly jun- junior staff member in comparison to him, etc. cetera. Um, towards, for about a nine-month period of me working in that firm, he, he, for about a couple of times a week, he would actually wait for me to pack up my stuff at about 5.30, 6 o'clock, whenever it was, when I finished work. And he would wait outside my cubicle and tell me to drive him home to his house. Like, he would tell me. Like, he wouldn't ask. He would tell me. He worked out that we live five minutes away from each other. He said, I'm jumping in your car today. You're taking me home. Oh, okay, okay, sure. And um, for about nine months, two, three times a week, he would jump in the car with me. And uh, I, found, I always found it strange because he was actually given a car parking bay, but on a few days in, in a week, he actually refused to drive. He would actually catch the train and the bus in, and he would choose to jump in the car with me, right? Now, in the car ride, I'm going, Lord... This is the last thing I need. It's like, I like my alone time in the car. <laughs> How many of you love your alone time in the car? How many of you like, you drive home and you know that you're going to come home to kids, you drive extra slow. And you tell your wife, it's like, it's peak hours terrible today. Two hours later, you get home and you're 4Ks away. You know what I'm, t- you know what I'm saying? Yeah, because you like your alone time in the car. The kids are all in bed, bath, fed, everything by the time you get home. This traffic's terrible today. It's getting worse in Perth. Here was I, in the, and he would pepper me with questions about the Christian faith. He found out I was a Christian. He, he began to ask me, what do you believe? Why do you believe it? What about human suffering? What if God is so good? He, he began to pin all of these, and I was a young adult at the time, and you know what? Like it, I, I didn't know as much as I do now, but I did the very best. Now, I would love to tell you that I saw those moments as just an, a divine opportunity for me to evangelize. Like I was, I would pray to God, God, give me the wisdom how to prophetically just speak to him and just really just read his mail and, you know, just, just, just minister to him. I was praying the opposite. It's like, God, please don't let him be outside my cubicle when I, when I finish packing out. Oh, Lord God, no. Because how many of you feel like you're Christian at 5.30? None of us do. It's the end of the day. You don't feel Christian at all. I know some of you don't even feel Christian before 10 a.m. before you have your three coffees. You're not Christian at all. You're atheist completely. There is no God until I have my coffee. Well, that was me at 5.30. And after about nine months, I actually lodged my resignation with the company because um, I'd been invited to come on staff in a full-time ministry as a creative pastor for the church that I was a part of. And I remember being the last day at work, that little morning tea in the boardroom, and I was given five minutes to share about what I was doing. And I began to share about our church and, and um, the church I was going to be a part of. I was, you know, um, going to be in ministry, what that meant and what my faith meant to me. And he was actually in the room at the time. And you know, my, my last day at work came and went, and I transitioned then into, into full-time ministry. That was year 2000. And um, for, oh, I don't know, maybe about another six or nine months, 
didn't hear from him, didn't know what happened. It was a completely different part of my life. I was now well into, into full-time ministry. I was now a creative pastor. And just a few months into 2001, I remember clear, I, if I close my eyes, I can still see it. It was the 9 a.m. service, and I was cracking into the first song, Good Morning Church. The band was, was just about to hit the first note. Who do I see walking through the back doors of the auditorium? That manager that I used to work with. What I didn't know at the time, I found all this out later, was that he, he walks in with his wife. He was the guy that had that Christian wife that was praying for him all those years. Didn't want anything to do with Christianity. Didn't want anything to do with it. Didn't want to hear what the wife had to say, but he wanted to hear it from somebody else. Anyhow, cut a long story short, another about a few months after that, I remember just, just at the altar call, the Salvation Appeal comes from the pastor and he puts his hand up. He gets radically saved by the grace of God. It's got nothing to do with me. This is the goodness of God. And, and, and so this was probably about, I don't know, end, towards the end of 2001, start of 2002. And he goes on and does uh, you know, marriage ministry, serves Jesus with his wife. And, and um, she finally gets the husband that she's been praying for. Make sense to you? Right? In 2004, we planned our church. Nation's Church was planned. I left the church. And, and so we were in the same church for about two, two and a half years together. Um, sort of, you know, we were friends now. Jesus did a work in me and in him too. Um, and, and we lost touch. And the next time I'd heard about him was probably about oh, maybe a few years into our church plant that he died tragically in an accident. I think about him a lot. I do. I, 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 think, about, I think about me and the regret sometimes I have as to my unwillingness in those drives to maybe be by the Father's side and share the Father's heart. I sometimes think, you know, what, what, if I just, what if I just led him to the Lord in the car in that first week? He, I, I could have bought him an extra few years with his wife serving Jesus with her. What, what, what if I just... But you can't live with regret. I remember, I remember that every time I think about God's heart and the urgency of the hour. None of us are promised tomorrow. No one in our community is promised tomorrow. But what are we promised? We're promised the grace of God and the forgiveness of Jesus. Should we repent and come to Him anytime while we can, while we're here on the earth? You know, when I think about the prodigal son and musician, you can join me. When I think about the text in Luke chapter 15, I can almost hear Jesus' heart. When the religious leaders of the day that were so studied and so educated and so well informed, they knew about God, but didn't have God's heart. They knew about Scripture, but Scripture wasn't alive in them. I think sometimes of how easy it is for so many of us to be in the Father's house, but still lost to the Father. My prayer for us is in this season of reaching those that are far from God. These things that we do, they're not gimmicks. Love community, Christmas party, and things that we do with Heroes Academy, things we do with playgroups, things that we do right across all our different campuses with food pantry, Christmas services. They're not so we can just do more church activity. They're because Jesus came for a humanity that was so lost. When I think about my friend, that manager that rode in the car with me all those months, some, you know how sometimes you try and replay back old conversations? You go, ah, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Ah, I should have said that better. I can't go back and change the past. I can't go back and change the 23, 24, 25-year-old me. But I can make a decision that from this day onwards, I'm going to stand by the Father's side. And at every chance I get, I'm going to be there putting robes on shoulders with that. Putting rings on fingers with the Father holding the feet of lost brothers and sisters and helping to put sandals on. Will you do the same? Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise?